and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, my name is Calvin Harrell. This evening or this afternoon, I will be moderating this event, uh, and I have a specific role that I'll be carrying out. Um, to get started, we're going to bring forth uh, the person whose individual vision and tenacity has brought this event here uh, to Vallejo. She has been um, <laughs> exhaustive in her efforts to bring together this esteemed group of experts, elected officials, and others so that we can have a dialogue with them and talk about what it takes to bring solutions to the challenges we have as opposed to simply what are the challenges. We know what they are. So now it's time to think about how do we move forward with solutions all the way up to the state and even the national level because the challenges that we face are not simply local. They hit us hard locally, but they are a national challenge for all urban areas. Mrs. Skari Sawande, would you please step forward? I want to thank everybody. Can you hear me? I want to thank everybody for coming out and let you know, also besides what he said while we're here, one of the reasons that I pressed forward is I am my daddy's child. And my dad back east from Baltimore was one that would get out there and fight for our, his community. And so when I was going to City Hall and seeing the needs there and feeling that they were not being met, I reached out to Tom Barty and told him of my concerns. I also reached out to Mel Opelia and told him of my concerns that the families were not being heard and where were their voices. And so Tom got back in touch with me and said that um, Senator Dodd wanted to, to hear us and hear what we had to say. He asked if I would come and talk with Senator Dodd. I said, I want to bring my crew so that we can sit down and talk about the issues that are going on. It's not just simply about the families, because that's the catalyst that shot this forward, but we've been dealing with issues that have been going on in this community for quite some time and a long time. I'm grateful that Senator Dodd took the time to say yes to what we asked. I'm grateful that Assemblyman also took the time to say yes and to be there for us, and I'm grateful that um, uh, Congressman Thompson came aboard and wanted to participate with us. This is about you. This is about all the words and things that we've been talking about for a long time. The first time we talked about our issues and our feelings, that was the first meeting that we had. The second meeting that we had, we brought together city council members and what have you and asked them to come and participate and so that our community can talk about what they are feeling, how they feel and what they want to see changed in this community. We keep talking about, and I say it over and over again, about the wonderful diversity, which truly we have, but we all want to feel that same diversity. We want to see some major changes from mental health, how it, all of these killings, and we have to address it as to actually what it is, how these killings are affecting not only the families, but it's affecting our community day to day. We want to see change, and so this, row of people were brought here with hopes that we can move forward. We, we can't yell and scream at each other. At some point, we have to start talking and say, how can we move things together legislatively so that we can make some changes for this truly beautiful community that I chose to live in? So with that, I want to turn it over to um, you for our next person. Very good. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, this young lady, uh, through artistic inspiration from the artist, she is not the specific artist. She happened to be the model for the artist. There is a project here in Vallejo called the Genius Girl Project. It is a statue of a beautiful child with fist and armed raised. The child is to be bron is bronze in tone, so it fits the the nature of our blended community here. I'd like to call forward Myla J from the Genius Girl Project to give a short poem presentation. Hello, everyone. So I have a poem, and this is what the poem says. The future of our young black kids in the city of Vallejo is so important to me. But most of us fear some of our local police who is sworn in to protect you and I. Their policing is getting way out of hand. There needs to be a better plan. 
I know you're here to protect and serve, but this isn't all of what I have observed. It's the overkilling of our young black men, especially those without a weapon in their hands. It frustrates me to hear this news, and I'm afraid of being policed by you. Like I said, there needs to be a better plan. Violence for violence isn't a winning hand. You have became desensitized while another young man's family cries. I know you have a job to do, and you want to go home to your families too. But you can't keep decriminalizing the things you do. Can we find a new route or germinate new roots? Let's police our community so we can all retain our humanity and dignity. Thank you. I'd like to call, I'd like to call from the seventh generation inner tribal council, Ms. Melissa Mendoza. Okay, so I was asked to come speak and offer the opening on behalf of the seven generations inner tribal council and who we are is we're an intertribal organization of indigenous people that have been here for thousands of years. I got permission from my elders to offer a prayer that we may do this in a peaceful way and in a way that respects the land of where we are. This is traditional Karkino Ohlone land. This is traditional Miwok land, Pomo, and Patwin. This land hold historical diverse ties we need to find a way to make it that respectful and that ceremonial way again. Wopilatanka, thank you for bringing us all here today. We all stand here hoping to gain an understanding to create true leadership in the community, to bring peace and knowledge. I ask that you open all of our hearts and our minds to understand and truly listen to what the needs are underneath the surface beyond the violence. It's time to give our hearts up because leadership is a submission to duty. It is not rise to power. We have to remember that. And by everyone here today, I know you show us who our leaders are because we are all leaders and we all have this opportunity, Creator. Pilamaya. This forum is a place to participate in cause-related dialogue, and seek solutions on important needs and issues related to our Vallejo community. We will all respectfully listen to and respond, respecting values, viewpoints, and feelings of the individual. We will welcome new ideas and a diversity of opinions. We will avoid conflict, acknowledge the differences of opinion, and conflict will occur, and we pledge to resolve any conflict constructively as a standard practice and protocol required by the state of California, we are joined by the Sergeant at Arms of both the House and the Senate of the state of California, uh, as well as officers from the California Highway Patrol. Thank you for your service, gentlemen. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce our panel to start. Center stage is our, sen our Congressman from the United States Congress, sen uh, Congressman Mike Thompson. Bill Dodd is our state senator. Bill. Our state assemblyman is Mr. Tim Grayson. To my immediate left is our interim police chief, Chief Joe Alio. Pastor Brian Harris of the Emanuel Temple Apostolic Church also sits on the dais. Mike Radford, a senior consultant with the Police Officer Standards and Training Organization, is also here. And Jerry Threat, the former Sonoma County Law Enforcement Auditor, is here with us. In our audience, we have community and other leaders and experts. Mayor Bob Sampayan, <laughs> Vice Mayor uh, Pippindu, and the remaining council members. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Katie Meisner and Hermie Sunga. I'm not sure if Mr. Nyoff is with us today. Mr. Nyoff is here, our city manager. 
Pastor Don Reginski is here from Holy Trinity Lutheran. Dr. Adam Clark, the superintendent, and a special shout out goes to him. He's the superintendent of our schools. He has been gracious enough to provide these facilities at no cost to the organization or to the community for this event, both the staffing as well as the facility. We really thank you. <laughs> Captain Lee Horton with the Vallejo Police Department is here. <laughs> Dr. Prenda Tucker LaRue is here. <laughs> Melissa Mendoza, who just gave her uh, prayer, opening prayer. And Emery Cowan, the Deputy Director of Public Health in Solano County is here. She's on the front row. <laughs> Shay Walton from the MLK Project is also here. I believe. I don't see her. All right, we're ready for questions and answers now. Thank you very much. During the question and response portion of the program, questions must be specific to the forum topic, seeking solutions. We reserve the authority to rephrase the question for succinctness. Up to three panelists will be able to respond to any question. Each panelist is responding, uh, if responding, will be allowed two minutes to respond. A timekeeper protocol is in place and color cards will signal the end of their time period. If there is a follow-up question or additional time is required, the panelists will communicate with us and we will post the question and follow up on the Facebook page or if you've put your name on your question card, they will reach out to you directly. The first question comes from Mr. Jason Kishinoff. Will you support the demilitarization, demilitarization of our police and moving to neighborhood policing, and how would you go about doing that? So I think I'm on. Um, who asked the question? Jason Kinshaw. Hey, Jason, thank you. Um, so I'm always a little bit confused by the term demilitarization of the police because it can mean so many things. Um, so let me get right to the point of the question, which is, uh, do I support neighborhood policing? Um, and, and of course, the answer would be yes. I'm, I've got 33 years in the business, and what, what I find is it's people over programs. So anytime we, we try to put a, a name on something like demilitarization, um, everybody in the room would have a different idea what that means. Like, Take away guns has been suggested. No police officer should have guns. Take away armored vehicles. They should go away. Um, others would say, well, no, you have to have an armored vehicle because every once in a while we have horrific incidents in our town. So demilitarization is more difficult to answer, but neighborhood policing, my answer is absolutely. It's about getting to know people in every community in our town. Failure to do that means we fail in our profession, bottom line. Uh, that started in the 1800s when, they, when the phrase was developed for policing that the community uh, is the police and the police are the community. We're supposed to be one. And obviously, we're here today because sometimes there's a division. And so 100% in agreement with you. What are you gonna do? All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to let people know there are some resources here for anyone interested in options. Uh, should your community decide they would like civilian oversight of your police department, there are different models that are a possibility. There are also uh, information in the, the resource over here um, about different aspects of what's going on at the state level. And there's my contact information if anyone would like to follow up with anything. Um, just a couple of little points. Uh, as the chief mentioned, um, when you use these terms, a lot of people understand them in different ways. So for example, community policing can mean a, a lot of different things to different folks. It can mean that you're out having regular community meetings uh, with neighborhood groups. It can mean that you're involving that community in decisions about how you're going to police that community so that uh, when you're out there, the community feels like they've had a say in that. It can go from something as simple as a regular meeting in the, in the community all the way to having community members come in and help train your officers on the history of relationships between that community and the, and the police department so officers understand what they're walking into uh, that they may not be aware of. Um, and in terms of uh, the demilitarization question, really you know, a lot of agencies have these, the equipment that people refer to as militarized equipment for good reasons. And really the focus should be on policies on how that equipment is used and when it's appropriate to use it. And that's something you can have uh, input into with your police department. Thanks. 
Any others? If, if I may, uh, Tim Grayson, I served on local city council uh, as a council member as well as mayor. And as was uh, already put in both instances, um, community policing is a tremendous tool that connects and, uh, and creates that, that nexus between uh, the community itself and those that they have uh, depended on and lean on for public safety for, to serve and protect. I think when it comes right down to it, community policing, as it was described, involving people in the policies, bringing people into a, uh, into a conversation where they are actually a part of the policies that uh, unfold as to how policing takes place in their community. And uh, I think that's what determines what equipment, that determines uh, when the equipment is used, and really, when it comes down to it, community policing cannot be accomplished without the engagement of uh, of your local uh, of your local government, and allowing local government to be a part of that bridge between the police department and the people to be able to create the right policies that are both justified on one side and clarified and understood on the other. So, um, council is a great uh, facilitator for that. This question, the next question, has to do with police funding. Um, and there are three cards with questions that can be merged together. So I'm going to take the liberty to do that. Liat Metzenheimer, Mark Lampkin, and Susan Hurt each pose the question, how can our police department receive training that allows room for de-escalation prior to engaging with a firearm? One, can you pledge to find funding or to assist us in finding funding for pl uh, police training for de-escalation? And if funding is an issue, how can we find the funds to retrain and clean up the internal attitudes of defensiveness and intolerance resulting in overreaction by the police? The question is, speaking to you as our legislators, how can we go about accessing resources and funds for a community that's in crises relative to the increased training for officers or additional training for officers in de-escalation practices? Well, for, we've, we have a couple uh, bills that were before us uh, this year, um, AB uh, 392. First of all, I'm Senator Bill Dodd. Uh, AB 392, Stefan Clark's law, sets new rules on police uh, use of force, requires that uh, law enforcement use deadly force only when necessary instead of the current wording which says when it is reasonable. And this was a much discussion, you know, in the legislature this year. And one of the things that, uh, and, and Tim, you, I, I can't remember who's the author of SB 230, which is uh, oh, it's Senator Caballero, my colleague, uh, that was her bill. And now it's in the, uh, I've already voted on it and voted for this. It would give, because what we, one of the things we thought about was, Wow, you, know, you can set up a new, new rules and regulations on definitions, but if you don't give money to lo uh, local governments for uh, you know, funding uh, for this training, what, what, what good is it? We have to back it up. So clearly, SB 230 would give officers new tools, including training in de-escalation tactics, interacting with vulnerable populations, and alternatives to use of deadly for force. This is currently on the assembly uh, floor. I expect, I'm sure Tim does too, uh, to pass. I expect the governor to uh, sign that bill in an appropriation, an appropriation made uh, you know, in our budget. This is incredibly important because without the money behind it, it's just, again, you know, more words, more laws uh, you know, without following through. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'd like to just add, um, I'm Mike Thompson, the congressman from our area. And I'd like to add that uh, the House, uh, House Democrats just passed legislation that appropriates $3.4 billion uh, for a number of state and local law enforcement assistance grants. And uh, I'll, I'll go through just a couple of them here. There was $582 million for the Violence Against Women's Act. And for the first time ever in the uh, reauthorization of that measure, the VAWA, Violence Against Women's Act, we also expanded it uh, to make sure that uh, boyfriends who are abusers and stalkers, just like husbands that are abusers, are added to the pro uh, prohibited list for people who can buy uh, firearms. 
Uh, also, $260 million for the State Criminal Alien Assistance Program, $100 million for anti-human trafficking grants, $375 million for Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Acts uh, grants, and $85 million for Missing and Exploited Children's Programs. So those are all monies that would go uh, to the state and or local. Most of those pass through the state, but it's, uh, it's what the federal government is contributing uh, to help address these issues. Hi, my name is Brian Harris. I'm pastor of church here in Vallejo called Emmanuel Temple. I'm glad to be here. I'm aware that our, our current, our police department uh, here in Vallejo, they currently received a grant for some um, police community partnership through CalVIP. And so um, <clears throat> they've been doing some community outreach um, in uh, the Vallejo, particularly in the area where I serve um, in the community as, as, as pastor. And um, I'm also uh, aware that in partnering with uh, the community and, and, and community policing, you need to have those discussions with the persons that are mostly impacted uh, by the, uh, uh, the deaths in our community. Those are black and brown men particularly. And so having discussions outside of, of uh, those, those black and brown men, I mean, if you look in the audience here today, you know, on the panel, you look on the panel and on the audience today, you, you don't, we don't have the, the representation of black and brown men. And so we're talking about issues that will affect them directly, and, and we need to talk where they are and with them. Does, does that make sense? And so if we're going to have that discussion with them, and that's, that's the true sense of, of community policing. And, uh, and, and back, to, back to the point of, uh, uh, of uh, demilitarized, I was in the military, I was in the Marine Corps, and I, <laughs> and I believe in matching you know, fire with fire, you know, I mean, it's just that, I'm, and, and that, that doesn't mean an abuse or overuse of, of uh, <clears throat> weaponry, but we don't want our, our, um, our police um, or anyone that is protecting or serving and protecting to be um, uh, in a position where they don't have what's necessary to, to, to meet the needs to serve and protect our community. <clears throat> Thank you. The next question is a question that I pose. If I could just add. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, okay. I apologize. Uh, Mike Radford with, Radford with the Commission on Post. Three people. Wanted to give just a real uh, high-level overview of what, I'll give you a high-level overview of what Post does, where the Peace Officers Commission on, uh, or the Peace Officer Standards and Training. Uh, one of our primary goals is to certify and find best practices for law enforcement training. And just wanted to add that uh, part of our duties in, in what we're currently working on is we've received uh, $5 million to put forth uh, and to help s assist law enforcement agencies in de-escalation training. This is not a grant. No one has to, sign, uh, has to apply for it. Um, they, uh, can, uh, they can go to any uh, training, and the officers that go are completely reimbursed uh, and funded by, by post. This uh, gives a large incentive to try to send as many of their officers as they can to not only de-escalation, but we also have a large, uh, another $5 million for mental health training. We have $5 million for an integrative grant program that goes to uh, communities, uh, community uh, uh, resources that can uh, develop uh, particular programs in the areas of de-escalation. So we're currently in the process of um, trying to send that out statewide. Uh, lots of agencies are already taking that opportunity. We're seeing uh, a large amount of law enforcement officers attending more de-escalation, more uh, crisis intervention training than ever before. The next question is, uh, there's two, is a two-part question. Uh, this first one will relate to the funding issue. California currently has, based on statements by the past governor, and I expect that it exists again, a $30 billion surplus far in excess of reserves that are needed. So to our state legislators, knowing the conditions that this community suffers under and other communities similarly situated, what is the reason that movement has been made to allocate some of those funds legislatively to be used for such trainings as we're speaking to now and other uh, particular applicable uh, programs? Well, I think the point's you know, well taken. We do have a surplus, but you know, that was the rainy day fund. We all know that we've been through the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression you know, over the last seven or eight years, and we know what, that, what happened to our school systems. 
We know what happened to our safety net systems throughout the state of California. And the whole idea of the rainy day fund was to build something up so when the economy went down that we wouldn't have to go to Dr. Clark and say, I'm sorry, we got to cut your budget 20 percent. Or in those days, it was much more than, you know, much more than that. We wouldn't have to go to the county of, of Solano and say, I'm sorry for your safety net programs. We're going to have to cut you 35, 40 percent. So I think we're about $20 billion at this point in time. Uh, the, our current governor, uh, he needs a pat on the back for following the practices, I think, of uh, the, the, the previous governor. But just because uh, that money isn't able to be spent on these type of programs doesn't mean there's not the money there to spend on these programs. And uh, I think you just heard me in, in my remarks talk about how important it is for the money to follow the, pro the laws that we we passed the laws, uh, you know, need to have money behind them so uh, so that they work. So uh, let's let's not get concerned about the uh, surplus that we have in terms of the rainy day fund. That is for us. That is for all our communities uh, throughout the entire state of California. But uh, you know, I hope that we have the opportunity to have community town halls on a more frequent basis and perhaps next year at this time we can I can point to specific things that we've done right in this area where you're questioning valid question though and uh, to speak further on that I believe after this fiscal year which ends in uh, June of 2020 at the end of June we will be around a 20 billion dollar uh, surplus uh, again as was stated that covers uh, very, very important programs, especially when the times come that the revenue is not coming in and we have to dip into reserves to continue to fund our schools, to fund health programs, and uh, many other very, very important programs. I think what's important was SB 230 and the money that is allocated to go toward training. So the money, even though we have reserves, money is there. I think what happened was we saw, uh, we saw when term limits went uh, to six years, laws were being passed, policies were being passed, but follow-up wasn't coming afterward. There wasn't oversight. Now that uh, we have a little long, longer term limit, uh, we're able to pass policies, but then stick around long enough to make sure those policies work and to make sure that they're being funded. And I think it's incredibly important for your voice to be heard at the Capitol, whether it's a senator's office or an assembly member's office, and help hold our feet to the fire to make sure that if you're going to pass policy, then follow up and make sure that policy actually works and has the funding that it needs to come through and benefit the people. That's where we would all benefit uh, and working together, community and legislators. Well, I just add, and very quickly, um, I was in the state Senate when we had those bad financial times that uh, Bill uh, w uh, referenced. And I, I became the chair of the Senate Budget Committee uh, right after I got elected to the state Senate in 1990. So I had to sh uh, kind of steer the ship of finance uh, through the legislature. And I know what it's like to have to call the Dr. Clarks of the world and the city managers and the police chiefs and the transportation agencies and the county uh, folks to tell them that not only is there no money, but we're going to cut drastically your budget. And that was a very, very difficult time. So I want to applaud both of you for uh, understanding the importance of having the revenues uh, available. If we do go into a bad times, we'll be able to keep things afloat. It's oftentimes a challenge to sit in a moderator's position because you have a follow-up question to that then. Um, recognize that each of you have been a part of this overall community for quite some time. We have been in a perpetual underfunded condition. Perpetual. You indicate certainly that there's funding available, uh, even with a budget surplus, and I understand we want to reserve that for uh, specific uh, conditional uh, circumstances. But knowing that we are perpetually in that same condition, how is that money going to be allocated for the training to be given? Is it going to trickle down to those communities that are in the most dire straits, or is it going to be div divvied up amongst communities that don't even need the training because they don't have the same diversity of population or the same incidence rates? 
You know, I don't know the answer to the question, but I feel since I'm your senator that I need to speak on this. I, I absolutely do not know the, uh, the answer to that question, but I can tell you, uh, you have really hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, what the needs are and what the priorities should be. And I think that's something that we might, Tim, we might be able to put, uh, you know, into legislation. Perhaps a congressman with his experience on the budget committee might be able to, uh, um, you know, help us out there. There was already $20 million allocated in the budget uh, that was implemented with this SB 230, which um, my staff has uh, let me know here, which I'm a co-author of that bill. So that money is going to go, but how, that, how it's prioritized and how that money gets here will be a, a priority of mine uh, when I get back uh, to work uh, tomorrow, <laughs> Monday. Thank Calvin, you. I'll just Thank say you. quickly um, that I, I'm no longer in the state legislature, but I can guarantee you, you don't have, uh, there's, there aren't two other people as dedicated as the folks on my right and left here uh, to addressing this issue than our senator and our assembly member. And our local government folks who are here, uh, council members and, and the mayor in the, in the front uh, row, uh, they are on the spot whenever they mm -hmm. identify any funding sources, be it at the state or the federal level. And I'll guarantee you that the three of us will work with our local folks to make sure that we support any monies that you go after. And we've, uh, that's been the record so far, and I don't see that changing. Wonderful. I would like to um, thank you for that, Congressman, and I, but I would really like to hear from Mr. Radford, who uh, is very familiar with, because of the whole reason why we're here, how would that money, if it's allocated or when it's allocated to post, how does that go out to agencies? And how do we expect to see our fair share in Vallejo? Well, as, uh, uh, as the overall responsible uh, uh, department as, uh, when it comes to uh, either delivering training or assisting with uh, funding, um, we don't identify uh, certain areas uh, just because they're popular or they're more uh, populated. In fact, we make every effort to identify uh, underserved communities. One of the primary goals uh, during our uh, current, uh, our current um, uh, attempt to push out crisis intervention training, mental health training, and de-escalation training was to, uh, was to lower certain standards that we would allow for presenters to go to underserved communities, areas where law enforcement agencies don't have the, the type of funding as you would see in a major, uh, you know, a major city like Los Angeles or, or the Bay Area or, or other places. We make every attempt to uh, push that training out to those areas because we, we understand it's very difficult for these, these smaller agencies, these agencies that have uh, less funding to either send uh, their officers out to uh, identify training funding. So we, again, we work, uh, we're working very diligently to push training to those particular agencies. We, instead of asking them to come to us, we're reaching out and trying to come to them. Um, so again, the, the monies is, is available for everyone. We do everything we can with our regional consultants that are out in these communities, that we cover the entire state. All 80,000 law enforcement officers have a voice through our uh, through our regional consultants. And if, anyone, if any particular area is in need, they can communicate that and we will do everything we can to uh, take our resources, to take our presenters and to, uh, to send them out and get them the training that they need. Are there things that the city council can Thank you. Do? A council member wanted to speak to this too also? So the question is, is there anything that the city council could do uh, to assist? It's a partnership with their, with their chief. Uh, all uh, law enforcement agencies, whether it's a sheriff or a chief, um, should have some liaison or themselves uh, to uh, reach out to post. Again, we have uh, regional consultants that uh, communicate directly to every law enforcement agency uh, that participates with post in the state. And all they have to do is uh, make a contact, have a uh, you know, get in communication, identify certain needs, uh, regardless of the, of the type of training. But again, uh, as long as we can communicate and post tri uh, does very well uh, in, in their attempts to push out through monthly reports that we send to all training uh, managers throughout the state, uh, uh, communicating our, our surplus and maybe funding with, uh, with the de-escalation, with the crisis intervention, or the innovative grant program. 
and we have uh, dedicated staff that can reach out and talk one-on-one -on -one to any agency uh, throughout the state uh, and assist in getting them what they need. It came in too fast for you guys. To can I ask? I'd like to. Through the moderator, I'd like to ask him a question. Is that all right with you? Absolutely. Okay. So I, I guess what I'm interested in is, is okay, we got $20 million here now in, in the recent budget for this purpose. Do you run out of money uh, from cities? What are there, about four or five, 480 cities in the, in, in the state of California? Uh, does this money go really fast, or is, it, uh, uh, or is there always money out there for, for these trainings? It seems to me that there ought to be some key metrics that are used in prioritizing uh, funding, which would be, you know, population of a city, how many officers are involved, you know, shootings, uh, a, a number of those different key metrics would That's right. go a long way if there are, if there's too much demand for the money. So again, if a individual uh, city, municipality, uh, they control their own budget, and they can uh, allot and put aside a particular amount of funding for their own training. That is outside of the control of POST. The monies that we receive through POST, uh, which I'm excited to say uh, uh, grew by 40% this year. We went from, 41 million to eight, uh, from 43 million to $81 million. That money is, again, uh, used to identify and to present training throughout the state. We reimburse, uh, so say a city has a particular amount of money that they set aside for training, they can utilize that money to send their staff to training. And if it is a, and if it is a reimbursable training through post, we will reimburse that city uh, all funding from per diem to travel uh, uh, to even uh, backfill in some, in some circumstances. So how does Vallejo get in line? That's the Use the mic. What, so the question is, how, the so Vallejo is already plugged in. Vallejo can send their staff to any of these trainings uh, at any time. They identify uh, their staff, they, uh, who wants to go. They identify the training, uh, uh, whether it is local, whether it is somewhere within the state, or they can even find a presenter that can come to their agency and present. From there, the, the training is, is given. And under this, under a, say a de-escalation uh, course, uh, Post would be able to reimburse them the full cost of all their staff attending the training uh, to make it a no cost to their city. If I, if, I might just I? Follow, if I might just follow up for a moment. Um, during the three years that I did civilian oversight for the sheriff's office, this is a, was a recurring issue that came up in terms of de-escalation training. And it's great that this money is available for reimbursement. It's going to really help. Um, another limiting factor, however, was the staffing levels of the agency. Because you have to realize that every time someone is going out to training, that means they're not going to be on the street and they need to be backfilled in some way so that there's adequate staffing out there for policing in the community and we're not leaving communities without any support. So um, I'm encouraged to hear that there's at least some money for backfilling and I'm, I'm wondering um, to what extent that is true because that's a key limit on the number of folks who can go to this kind of training for any agency. Yeah, sure, I was uh, listening thinking if I was sitting out there uh, after hearing all those numbers, at some point I'd want to know, well, what's happening in Vallejo? You know, uh, millions of dollars are interesting to talk about, but maybe what's happening with your Vallejo Police Department as it relates to uh, training? And the topic being discussed right now is de-escalation, um, but that's just one piece of, of many pieces of training that happen all the time at the Police Department. So let me break it down for you like this. I've only been here uh, 10 weeks in a day. Uh, on day one, the first document that came to my desk after a staff meeting uh, was a document that started with preservation of human life is the primary responsibility of all advanced officer training within the city of Vallejo Police Department. So that's where we started on my first day because I, uh, as uh, some of you we've talked before, there's a really old document that says this, that these inalienable rights belong to everyone who lives, works, plays, or walks through Vallejo, and that is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and you don't get the last two without the first one. And so on day one, I made the priority as this conversation about preservation of human life. So that's the culture conversation that we have to have in the police department all the time. I'm not suggesting it hasn't been there. Uh, some would say it hasn't. I would not suggest that. Um, but I'm saying it has to be the ongoing conversation. Secondly, post mandates for us how much de-escalation training we have to have. And we're in compliance. We get de-escalation training. 
Um, thirdly, we're not satisfied with just the post requirement. So every month, multiple times in the briefing where they start their day, we look at de-escalation by uh, discussing recent cases that went well and went poorly within our own agency and also looking around the nation at things that are being discussed to hopefully consider uh, de-escalation. Uh, next, on my desk today, there's a memo. We sent an officer, because Post paid for it, to some de-escalation training in Southern California. The officer came back and was so impressed with the type of, I see your time up, uh, for the citizens though, so impressed with what they learned. They said, we want to pay this gentleman to come and teach our entire department uh, de-escalation from a different perspective. Um, that's there. And then de-escalation always requires cooperation at some level, right? Um, so you can de-escalate all you want. And if you ever want to look at all the de-escalation cases, uh, we document them. Um, the ones that, where there's lack of cooperation means it's hard to de-escalate. Uh, and things get uh, very difficult. And the last thing the gentleman at the end said was, I've never been in a more poorly staffed police department than I have been these last 10 weeks. And I work with resilient, exhausted men and women every day. So to get them into training is a challenge. And hopefully we'll fix that. In December of 2018, Congress passed a bill making individual legislators personally liable for portions of their sexual harassment lawsuits and claims. Uh, there were limitations on what would be covered and what would not. However, they became personally liable. It seems that uh, through that process, it has been well researched that uh, personal liability results in better compliance to the standards and expectations a community or a nation has in that respect. At the national level, and certainly at the state and the local level, what are the impediments to creating a condition where there is an element of protection, yet the exorbitant expense of inappropriate actions or what the public deems is inappropriate actions, actions which result in lawsuits, uh, what is the extent to create something of that nature for the law enforcement community? Is that from a, from a federal perspective? If uh, well, the federal would be great because it would go nationwide. Well, I, I can tell you on, on the first part of your question, uh, the sexual harassment portion, I think Congress passed uh, good legislation mm -hmm. uh, that uh, dealt with a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we did it, we also uh, ensured that there was proper training that went along with that. Mm -hmm. So everyone knew exactly um, what was expected of them and how they should behave. It was, I went through all of that training, it was uh, a little a little shocking uh, from my perspective that people would have to be told some of the things that we were told. It uh, goes back to the, if you don't want to see it in the front page of the Phileo paper, don't do it. Um, and, uh, and the things that our parents taught us when, when we were growing up. Uh, so we've gone through that. I know in my office we have an employee handbook that, uh, uh, that uh, I helped write that lays out all of the procedures for everyone. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, and the chief can probably speak to this, or, or uh, the post representative, but I'm assuming that law enforcement uh, has the same level of guidance, uh, and uh, law enforcement officers are trained. There's always the question as to whether or not that training should be expanded or uh, more inclusive to bring in other, uh, other issues, and that's something that I think as a community uh, we go through all the time. And, uh, and I don't think that uh, any of that training for either members of Congress or police officers should be chipped in stone. Uh, that needs to be fluid and needs to be able to respond to uh, issues or problems of the day. Okay, the question was, what are the impediments to implementing such a program, such legislation, to assist communities or to assist law officers uh, so that there is an understanding that your actions have consequences far beyond being uh, released from duty for a few days and then put on desk for a few months? I'm sorry for saying it in that manner, but that was the question. What are the impediments to such a process? Well, uh, I think all of us in this room would clearly understand there's cause and effect for everything. There's consequence for everything. And I think uh, 
what you're really trying to, uh, or at least what I believe we're trying to accomplish or get to here from that question is how do you hold someone accountable for what they do? And when it comes right down to it, is having clear, understood policy that, uh, that was transparent, that lays out expectations, and then sticking to those policies and enforcing those policies no matter who it is, what it is, or where it happens. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's something that can be accomplished without, uh, without, putting, uh, without approaching it from a, a negative aspect of impediments, approaching it from, well, how can we accomplish stronger accountability to hold people accountable for their actions? And I, I really think that's clearly laying out the fact that, number one, we have law, and making sure that, uh, that nobody's exempt from uh, the righteousness of, of justice. We have one set of laws in the United States. And if the Congress can assess themselves this condition, that they must be held responsible for their actions after training, then why is it that law enforcement can't be held accountable in the same manner? That's, the, that's really the crust of the question. Sir. Um, yeah, I just want to make a couple of points uh, to this question. So we hold people accountable generally for harm to others through our court system, and that can happen through the federal courts or the state courts, and there are different standards in each of them for how an officer would be held accountable uh, if they're sued for harm to another individual. And in the federal courts, the Supreme Court um, has set the standards for the minimum standards for that liability. And one of the things that um, prevents liability uh, in many cases where the courts have said there's a violation of the Fourth Amendment here is a concept that's called qualified immunity. And that means that if there's not a clear standard out there that the officer should have known would guide their behavior, then even though their behavior violates the Fourth Amendment, they will not be held liable for that act. So courts have dealt with that differently, and some courts say that you have to have a, a precedent that's already happened that is exactly what is the same as the situation that is coming before the court this time. And that is a really strong limit on holding um, officers accountable for behavior that might harm another. And um, in the state courts, um, there's a different standard, and California has recently changed the standard for use of force uh, the, the bill passed, the, the state legislators who are here participated in that, yes. and it does change the standard. And the standard can be changed by the Congress, it can be changed by uh, the state, and also it can be changed through policy by the, your local agency through your city council. Anybody else? I have a question uh, from Kay Patrice Williams. Uh, how many, uh, I think this would be directed to the chief or staff, how many officers of the Vallejo Police Department have attended de-escalation training and, uh, and ha uh, can that de-escalation training be mandatory once the backfill issues are addressed? Um, well, it is mandatory and so 100% of the police department has already had de-escalation training. I forget how long ago the state law passed or mandated it. But so they've been through it multiple times and will continue to uh, as part of the, so it, um, staffing's a challenge, but there are certain mandates that the state gives us for training that have to be met. And then post will come audit us to make sure that we've met it. And if we fail, they'll call us to account. So 100% have, have received that training. Uh, receiving the training and applying it are two different things. Right? That's the reality of what we're discussing. So that isn't lost on me. Um, so I, I don't want you to hear 100% we're good, 100% um, have received the training. And, I, and I'll also add that I think sometimes, you know, we go back to our default measure of, of who we are at our core and how we were raised and, and our perceived judgments of, of, of individuals. We, we, we can receive training on how we should act and behave and and to, to, to your point is what, what our parents taught us and, and, and how we were culturally raised and how we identify individuals. Uh, that, that needs to be spoken to at its core. As, and, and I think we learn that as we sit down with one another and really look eye and eye um, into one another's eye and, and uh, so that we will, <clears throat> uh, I don't know, help to uh, 
get rid of some of those, those preconceived notions and judgments of, of individuals. And we're, again, particularly we're talking about um, a large portion of these, these incidents are, are acted upon black and brown males, then, then you have to begin to know who they are. And, and I'll not say, that, say this, I know my, my time is, is, is going quickly. My wife and I, we sent our son to Southern California to attend a small community college in a small town. And I got one minute to say it. And, and, and he, he's, he's renting a room, he's walking to school, and he gets pulled over uh, yeah, well, by he's walking to school, handcuffed, put on, on the curb, um, because the people in the community where he was renting a room do not look like him. And they, there's a call from a, probably a <clears throat> elderly uh, a woman, I mean, or, or that's what the call that came in. There's a man walking in our neighborhood. And he gets pulled over, handcuffed. And so we get to, to meet with the police chief and talk. And, and then they get to know our son and, uh, uh, and, and the officers there. And so that he's just trying to get, get the football practice or he's just trying to get the class and, um, and not causing harm in the neighborhood. But there's those preconceived notions that we have someone in our neighborhood that doesn't look like us, that they're up to no good. And that, that's, that's the crutch of what we have to fix in our, in our communities. Sensitivity. Can I? Yeah, that's... Can I add to the pastor's comments by saying about 20 years ago, um, we were doing cultural awareness training so that things that he just described should never happen. Um, that's why when I say, you know, we can have training, but then we have to hold each other accountable to the standard of the training, and that's the first line supervisors on the street. So that was an exact example back when we were getting cultural uh, diversity training um, about a call that comes from somebody walking in a neighborhood, and that's all you have. Um, well, they're, they're, that's just to pull up and say, hello, somebody called. They were concerned about you. How are you? And then you get to meet the person. They go, I live in that house. You go, good. Have a great day. And then you go tell the other person. That should never happen. Um, and yet it still does. And so training has to, has to be applied uh, in, in the real world. You spoke to um, what was done 20 years ago. Are you implying or stating that that diversity bias implicit and explicit bias understanding is no longer a part of training protocol? No, it's, I'm, I'm making the point that that's how long ago we started that discussion. Um, and I remember sitting in the classroom uh, having guys argue about how they would deal with that particular person called in in a neighborhood. Uh, so the point is it, it happened that long ago. It continues today. So we should weave well past what was just described and whatnot. If, if I might and, speak to... To a moment, um, for a moment to that, um, there's been some research on uh, what's called implicit bias training uh, and what actually works and what is less effective. And the research is showing that the kind of training that works is training that is scenario-based training where you actually enact scenarios where you're encountering someone who may be in a group that uh, has suffered systemic oppression and who is in a group that our culture teaches us we should be afraid of. Because let's be clear, um, our culture teaches us these messages. All of us receive these messages through the culture that we live in, that certain groups of people are more dangerous than others. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important in this type of training that it not be rolled out in a way that um, accuses the officers of having some sort of racism, but rather it just recognizes that we all carry these biases inside us, and that unless we bring it to consciousness and work through it so that we have it in our muscle memory, like over and over through these scenarios, encountering folks who, who may trigger that fear, and then working through that fear so that you don't react to it more quickly than you would for someone else, that's the kind of training that works. Um, it takes longer, it's more intensive, it's more expensive, it takes officers off the street longer, but it's more effective. Um, so it's something important to think about. Let me, Thank you. I'm going to make a, qu a real quick uh, you know, note here that uh, Post is uh, wrapping up uh, a completely revamped procedural justice training portion, which will be, in, uh, through mandate, uh, introduced into law enforcement academies. There'll be four hours in all law enforcement academies uh, as soon as it's, uh, it's completed. And we'll also be revamping all procedural justice training that'll be offered to all law enforcement uh, agencies throughout the state. 
And I think you might have been sitting in the class because that's ex through subject matter experts that we brought in. Uh, that was exactly the style of training that we are that we are pushing out. We're giving officers the understanding of what implicit bias is uh, through and ex as well as explicit bias. Uh, we're basing it through um, uh, learning activities. We're making it uh, no, uh, trying to non-accusatory, and trying to get buy-in through officers to let, him, let them all understand that uh, implicit bias is really something that we all have. They have no control over it, but they need to understand what it is and how it might affect them and how they can uh, go out and work within their community uh, and treat people with a better understanding. We put historical aspects uh, as part of that, and we give them case studies for them to actually research themselves, and I'm very excited to see uh, this new procedural justice training go out statewide. Thank you very much. We are making a slight change. We're at one hour right now. We're making a slight change in the protocol of the timing. The commentary that you guys are providing, the feedback has been outstanding. However, there's more than three people actually uh, following up on the question. And we do want to hear what the fourth person has to say because there are very salient points within that construct. What we will do, though, for each additional person after three, your time will be cut to 90 seconds. The next question is from Sandra Martinez. Uh, is there any possibility that the Vallejo Police Department can offer time to conduct a course in the middle schools to start recruiting, training uh, future law enforcement officers while they are young? How are we planting the seeds for those that are from the community to learn to police the community? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, right now, the, the police department is in third grade classrooms. Uh, last year, 100%, I believe, doctor, 1,100 third graders, uh, a police officer spent an hour in every classroom. At that age, we don't have anyone working in middle school presently. I can tell you it's a great idea. I'll, I'll share a challenge with you. Um, uh, I'll share a challenge with you, and that is, in Fairfield, we opened something called the Public Safety Academy. And so there are 800, now there's about 1,000 young people there who are with police officers every day uh, and firefighters some days. Um, it's a, a, it's a, a, a school of choice, so it's not a gate school. It's a school of choice. You choose to be there. You choose to be there on time. You choose to wear a uniform. And the academics are going through the roof, really nice program. But the first and second graduating class, uh, 95 98% of those graduating don't want to go into law enforcement. So we live in a day where um, because of the fact that uh, there's such a focus on the 1% of what police do, that, that, uh, and it's the conversation all of the time, that young people are like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And if you ask a room of police chiefs, you get 100 police chiefs, would any of you want your young people going into police work? You rarely see a hand go up. So we're at a crisis point. 60% um, down is the last number I read in a Washington Times article of application. So being in middle schools is, is a great idea. Um, my fear is that a decade from now, I'm not sure who's going to be doing the job. Uh, I remember, you might know the name James Comey. I sat in a room with him. He said um, his fear is that good men and women who used to say, I want to be in police work, will still be good men and women who are teachers and firefighters and nurses and social workers, but they want nothing to do with law enforcement. Uh, based on our present day. And so that's a fear of mine. Um, but uh, you're 100% right. Middle school would be a great place to start. Probably elementary school would be a great place to start. I mean, there was when I was six, you know, we, we, <clears throat> we were taught to value and respect police. But, and, and to the fear, to the fear base from, from, biases that maybe even officers have, you have those same, that same fear and biases that now children have in them at such an early age now that where they don't want to go to the police or don't want to shake their hand or, or um, <clears throat> don't want to, you know, say hi to the officer. And that, that's the real challenge we have. And so that training doesn't have to just have it go one way towards the police, but back towards the community. Um, and, you know, we got, a, we got a big ship to turn around. And, uh, of course, we didn't get here overnight, and uh, it won't take overnight to turn it around either. Is there currently a firefighter academy in the Vallejo Unified School District? There is. And it, how was that uh, uh, brought about? Do, would you like a mic? Uh, can you share with us? Can you get a mic? I brought you a mic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. 
So it's a partnership that um, we have with the um, Vallejo, with the Vallejo Fire Department, and they um, historically have targeted our high school students and begin working with our high school students in this academy. But actually, this last year, they started recruiting in the middle school, and they found these students to be um, farther, um, furthermore in, engaged in the process and are, are really into it. So we're looking at expanding that and looking at bringing in some MI, um, some EMT services and things of that nature, and we would love to do something similar with police if that was possible. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Clark. I've best just been informed there is an excellent state curriculum for criminal justice class. It is not to train uh, or to recruit them. It is to educate the youth about cr criminal justice. So we perhaps need to access that within our school system as well. Uh, Clarence Martin asked the question, as we all know, the city of Vallejo was once a thriving, great city. It is currently on its way beyond, be, past greatness. The police department must also evolve as we do that. What is your stance on the use of non-lethal weaponry? I guess I, I'd be the one on that. Um, uh, 100%. 100%. Um, uh, on a regular basis, um, well... So there's 67, 68,000 interactions in 2018. 5% uh, of the 3,000 arrests that were made in 2018 resulted in a use of force. So of the 3,000 arrests, only 5% used any force at all. And the majority of that force was less lethal weapons, tasers, uh, rubber, projectiles. Uh, so it's a normal part of what happens on a regular basis in the, in the police department. Um, uh, it, it's not regularly reported. I mean, there's not a report form that says uh, to all the public, hey, of the 3,000 arrests, only 5% resulted in use of force. And of those 5%, most of that was a less lethal deployment of some sort. Um, because if it was a lethal deployment, you'd know about it. It would be the conversation of the day. Um, and so it's just a normal part of, of what occurs in policing. And... Um, uh, there should be more of it. Uh, this is a question regarding funding for mental, mental, uh, mental health uh, resource, funding for mental health resources for officers and affected community members. Uh, is there a resource that we are unaware of, that staff is unaware of at the city level, for funding to assist those families and individuals with mental health issues related to um, their loved ones being uh, killed in, in, in incidents. And if there is none, why not? Nobody aware of any? I'm, I'm not aware of any funding, but yes, yes. And yes. And we know you're going to take that up to Sacramento at least. Yes. Thank you very much. I've been... Uh, Outstanding I, question. That was a right. compilation of a question from about seven people. I would like to thank them. Jason Kinishoff, uh, Lisa Gutierrez-Wilson, Diane Merrick, Liat Metzenheimer. Thank you very much for that question. Can yes, I, uh, I... The name's not on the card. Public health. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please, we have a, an expert in public health services right here. I'm sorry. Um, actually, mental health. Um, mental health. So uh, what I would talk about is the MHSA Act, uh, Prop 64. And so through that act, we do fund a lot of um, interventions for family members and children. Um, we're actually in the development of a crisis intervention team training that we want post-certified. Um, so this is a really good time to talk about that because not only do the police officers experience trauma, the families and services are, you know, are seeking services for their children. And so we do a lot of funding through that, through the MHSA Act. So Solano County has taken it upon ourselves to develop a law enforcement liaison so that we can reach out to the different police departments. And so we're hoping that Vallejo would be at the table to help us roll this out through our whole community. Um, and our mental health advisory board, Monica Brown, her, the chair, she's here. So together we're trying to put this in the funding. So thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. I, I will add that uh, one of my greatest frustrations 
in law enforcement has been and will continue to be that the first responders for mental health patients in our community is the police. And um, it's in my world, in my, in my worldview, that is completely unacceptable that we would be satisfied that somebody we train to do policing would be the first responders of mental health calls. And I can't tell you how as a chief in my last place, I banged on the door of that county and said, I need social workers on the street. We have a, we have a homeless and a mental health uh, crisis in our cities. Why is it that we refuse to have but one or two at a time for an entire county? Um, and so who do they meet? They meet us. Uh, and I've always said the best person to meet them is a social worker. Social workers are gifted human beings who know how to interact in a way that sometimes we don't. All the training in the world, we're not going to be who you are, right? Because you're gifted in what you do. And so we need social workers out on the road to be with us, right? We yeah. like it. If, I'm, if I might add one thing, um, when you're considering that type of program, uh, there is um, something that's taking it to the next level, and it's called trauma-informed policing. There's a program that's been rolled out in the city of Camden where they've, uh, they've trained their officers in two areas, both in how to interact with folks who have suffered trauma in their lives and how to interpret their actions in ways that may be, because their actions may mean different things if someone has been involved in trauma than if someone is a criminal that has a history of uh, using force against others. They can be interpreted different ways. And also to teach officers about the trauma that they themselves experience on a daily basis that impacts the way they view things and can make their triggers a little bit quicker than they might otherwise be. And it's, it's had really great results. So it's something that I, I would suggest that you might take a look at just to, to see whether it might be something that fits your community. This question will be a paraphrased question from Jean Leckover. I hope that I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Chief, this goes directly to you but uh, the, uh, because you will know what we do here in Vallejo, but the other panelists as well. Do you think that it might be a great idea to set a state standards for LELs and that they be trained at the state level as opposed to allowing individual departments, our department, do the training for the officers from the inception, from the uh, onboarding uh, process so that they all have a standardized format for training and then they can get localized updating for the specific conditions that they might be uh, dealing with? Yes, good question. That's exactly what exists now in California. That there, there is state mandated training for every police officer uh, through the police academy. And then much of the advanced officer training is also uh, the exact same throughout the state. And then it, it's um, on a lesser level individually based on the community and the type of trainers you have in-house. But exactly what the question is, is how it is in the state of California so that we can have consistency. And California has always been a leader on that type of training throughout the the, the U.S. Post um, holds us the task, and like you heard from my uh, post partner on my left, um, they're always looking at revamping what we're doing, uh, and so we can't say we had that training five years ago. They'll say unacceptable, here's your new training. Everybody has to go through it, and then we have to prove that we've actually done it. We have to bring in trainers, and so uh, the state is, is the mandator of, of the majority of our training. Mr. Radford, uh, the question is, is for you in post. Uh, the question comes from Karen Sims. Uh, she would like to know, we would like to know, how much money from your program has been given to Vallejo over the last three years? An approximation is fine. Uh, thank you. That, that would be, that's it. I, I, I have no ability to answer that uh, sitting here at this moment. Uh, we would have to... Uh, do a particular audit of Vallejo and all of their law enforcement officers because each officer, uh, outside of the mandated training that they have, they have the option to take uh, other trainings that are above and beyond, uh, maybe in specific areas. So unfortunately, I don't have that information, but um, we can make every effort to answer those questions uh, at a later date. When a police department is meeting post requirements and still leads in crises, what action does post take or are they not involved? Well, when we say action, I, I'm not sure what type of action that uh, 
that the question is referring to. Uh, a lot of times the questions come out is, can POST uh, pull a certification of a law enforcement officer? And the question of that is no, and that is uh, by law. Uh, the penal code specifically says that uh, the commission, which is POST, shall not have the authority to cancel a certificate previously issued to a peace officer. Uh, so we don't have that uh, ability to actually pull a certification of a law enforcement officer unless that certificate was obtained through fraud uh, or any other you know, illicit uh, fraudulent uh, means. Question coming from Anissa Nold. Is there anything our state or our local legislators can do to help correct the apparent lack of supervision and discipline that has been rampant in Vallejo for decades? What if anything, what of anything can be done for that problem? How does the state, how does the state step in to provide assistance and guidance in those we, in Vallejo and other areas that are recognized to be in crises? I think a system already exists that uh, could be utilized um, more efficiently or effectively through, uh, you have your local level, then you have what is county uh, oversight through DA, then you have uh, the AG, Attorney General for the state, as well as what you're doing right now, making your voices known uh, in a sense to your legislators that can carry that voice and provide the oversight and make sure that what is set in place is actually being utilized to its fullest extent. You know, just, I've not given this much thought just the, the time since the question's been asked and thank you for taking a little time so I had a little more time to think about it. But, you know, I think, it, you know, to, to, to your point about this uh, certificate, you know, there, is, there are some things that we can do in the, in, in, the legi in the legislature in terms of looking at that. We have state contractors, license boards, that we look at people all the time and how they behave themselves in terms of when they go to your house and how they uh, behave in their conduct while they're there, if, if they, uh, you know, are uh, making sure they pay their bills or if the fr fraud fraudulent activity, and we can pull their license. And it sure seems to me that uh, we, we should have more you know, oversight in terms of uh, that certificate uh, when we have any conduct, and I'm not just talking about uh, uh, you know, law enforcement, but I would include them as well. When you're not meeting the standard, uh, you shouldn't be on the street. Just a, a couple of more points. Um, so the decertification thing is certainly an option at the state level. Uh, the law could be changed that prevents posts from decertifying an officer who's violated standards, and, and in particular, significant standards like uh, illegal use of force. So it could be changed to pull certifications from officers like that so that they couldn't leave and go to another agency. Um, one issue that comes up in investigations is when a particular officer has been involved in uh, a violation of policy, sometimes that officer resigns rather than stay through to the completion of that investigation. Another change that might be made is to require that investigation to be completed so that an officer can't retire and then go work someone else without that stain on their record. And uh, finally, um, there has been a proposal that has come up in the legislature before and could come up again which would create a state-level independent investigative office that would handle all investigations of local police officers who are alleged to commit significant misconduct. M one of the main issues in local communities is often that the community doesn't trust the investigative process locally. This would take it away from any uh, perceived influences of local, uh, you know, of the locality influence in that outcome, and it would take it to a state level professional investigators who could do that, that work instead. Thank you. Uh, this is a question from Lisa Gutierrez Wilson. Um, are officers provided random drug testing? Are officers provided random drug testing as a part of their general job duties, or are they only tested after incidents? So, so the answer is no, there's no random drug testing for police officers. Um, there's only drug testing if there's an indication someone's under the influence. 
And the reason that there is none in such a sensitive area, in light of the fact that airplane pilots are randomly drug tested, and others that aren't carrying around weapons of mass destruction in many times, uh, is there a reason that that exists? Um, well, I'm a little caught off by walking around with weapons of mass destruction. Forgive the hyperbole. Um, <laughs> a little bit uh, hyperbolic, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I get it. Um, so it has, I, I don't know the long uh, term answer why it's been this way. I do know, though, that the, the, there's no mandated law that says there's random drug testing. Um, so if there's not a law that mandated, mandates it for any particular person in our... So policing, we try to look at um, from a constitutional perspective. So I look at every contact should be constitutionally correct in how we deal with people. Um, and so, but I also feel strongly that should be the same for everyone that I, that I manage and supervise. And so if the law mandated that that was part of it, like it is for pilots, that the legislators thought that should be normal, just random testing, and that normally comes with a reason. Like, I, I think you can find the airline history back to the bar in airports and, and flying, right? There was a connection, I think, when that law was written. And so uh, if the legislators saw a connection between uh, influence and behavior of police officers, then they might write a law to, to bring us there. But if it isn't there... Um, just like if you're uh, in any other profession, uh, you'd want to apply the same protections the Constitution gives to everyone. Uh, I, I think that that's something that, uh, you know, I, we, we, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the families that were involved in, in some of these shootings here over you know, the last few years. And that was one of the commitments I made to, uh, to look at that more closely, like should in communities, uh, should the police force that, uh, you know, had the shooting, should they be able to investigate their own officers in that case? It seems to me, I know in a lot of areas that we uh, we serve in, that's not the case. I think the other thing is you have truck drivers. There's a lot of professional uh, professions that you have when they're in an accident. And I would certainly think, you know, look, in many cases, sometimes these, you can call them accidents where they're, and should, where they're shootings, there should be uh, drug testing of some, you know, of some kind. So we're going to look. We'll be looking uh, into that. I think it's if if it's certainly fair for other professions, it should be fair. I think for the seriousness of of these situations. Pastor Harris, a question has been specifically directed to you. Uh, you pointed out rightly so that we are missing the very people who are most greatly affected by the issues this forum brings about. That is black and brown men. What are your thoughts on what needs to happen and how should we go about engaging them as a part of this dialogue? Just, just as we have a forum like this, we need to, and, and, and mostly your black and brown men, they may not come to a forum like this um, uh, perhaps, but you have to go where they are and uh, say, hey, let's meet and let's talk and let's have some dialogue together um, so that um, we get to understand you, you get to understand us. Um, and at the end of the day, the police, they want to go home to, to their families, and so do the uh, black and brown men that are um, being pulled over or stopped. They want to go home to their families also. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately, uh, the, the black and brown men that have gotten pulled over in incidents, you know, they lose out on, on those opportunities. So. Uh, getting to, to have that dialogue um, back and forth, um, you, um, <clears throat> the congressman talked about uh, just culture and how, you, how you're raised and um, to you know, respect authority. Uh, and the, all, all those areas are being challenged in our life. But um, there has to be respect for, for, for both cultures, both, both the police culture and, and the African-American uh, men and their culture. And neither one of them want to be disrespected or put down or talked or, or, or felt less than. And, and when you have those those fears and preconceived notions about one another, you're, you're going to have fire, um, fire with fire, and it's going to. It, and unfortunately, it, it leads up someone not being able to go home to their family. It ends up being, in many cases, the the African American male, uh, in, in in many instances. Calvin, if I may. Yes. Um, 
I think it's real important that uh, as many people as possible are involved in our process of representative government. Uh, every color, every height, every weight, everybody. The more people involved, the better off we are. And I've started something in, um, I started, started right here in Solano County, a student leadership council, and it was very successful, and we're expanding it to the entire congressional district this year. So um, here's the homework for today. Uh, go out and tell your teachers, go out and tell your students, go out and tell your kids, your grandkids, uh, spread the word. We want young people involved. And the more folks that get involved, the more diversity in that involvement, the better off we'll be uh, as a community. Um, I, I just want to take a moment to talk about, a, first to give a plug for civilian oversight agencies, and then to talk about a success that we had uh, during my tenure, in, three year tenure in Sonoma County and actually doing this kind of engagement. So I agree 100,000% uh, with Pastor Harris that you have to go where folks are. And if you're uh, someone who's coming from outside the community to do that engagement, you need to connect first with people that are trusted by people in the community and have those folks invite you in and host you to do that engagement. That bridges the distrust gap that is very prevalent and communities that have had poor relationships uh, with the police. So uh, in Sonoma County, uh, one of the first efforts we did was to do uh, a review of policies that involved our undocumented community, the sheriff's policies around that. And we did a significant outreach through community organizations, went out to sit down with folks uh, where they were in the public schools and talk with parents about the concerns they have about local law enforcement and, and interacting with them. And from that, we rolled out a process of community circles where we invited those same folks to come out with us facilitating it, to sit down with officers and talk about that dynamic, that relationship, and what have been the challenges in that relationship. And that gave an opportunity for our undocumented parents to tell these officers what it's like to live in Sonoma County in that status and also for the officers to explain to our undocumented community what it's like to police that county. And I have to say at the end of that, we had about 60 families out for that uh, and we'd never had that in the county of undocumented families coming out before to a community meeting like this, especially with law enforcement. And everyone came away from that uh, meeting, law enforcement and community members saying that they were so grateful that it happened because they got to understand, and particularly the undocumented folks said, I felt like they saw me as a person for the first time. This is a question perhaps for uh, the chief, and it's probably a question that I don't know, I don't know that he'd have an answer. Uh, what percentage of police live in the city of Vallejo and in Solano County overall? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I apologize. Is that an answer that you can get to us so that we have reference points in the future? Um, I think I can. Yeah. I should Appreciate be able to give you an answer for that. I don't, I don't know what the percentage is. That'll work. And I, and I know in most police departments, the majority of officers do not live in the town they police mm -hmm. uh, statewide. The majority of officers live in a separate city for a variety of reasons. Uh, so it's rare to find a, a large percentage of officers policing and living in the same community. How can we have a third party, such as the Sheriff's Department, reveal Vallejo Police Department's use of force? The question was, I'll rephrase, what can be done so that a third party, such as the Sheriff's Department, would review the Vallejo Police Department in use of force issues? Um, I, I will say that it's possible in Sonoma County there is a, um, a memorandum of understanding among the chiefs of local police agencies, the district attorney and the sheriff's office, and the way it operates when there is a significant use of force that either could have or did result in the loss of life, then uh, another agency takes the lead in the investigation of that use of force so it's not done by the agency who employs the officer. 
For example, um, the sheriff's office often investigates uses of force by officers of the San, uh, Santa Rosa Police Department with involvement of the DA's investigators. And that um, use of force investigation is then turned over to the DA to make a review and a decision about whether that officer would be charged for that. Uh, the results then go back to the employing agency to use to for their um, decision about whether that officer violated their policies or not around use of force. That also is the uh, policy in Napa County as well. And, and Contra Costa. Do we not have a policy like that in Solano County? I don't know. You don't know? Yes, yeah, Solano County has the same protocol. Um, with the primary investigations of, of uh, the question is use of force. Um, so I, I, I heard the question as just general use of force. Uh, but if you're talking about uh, major incidents with uh, serious injury or death, we have an MOU in the county that handles it very similarly with the district attorney being the lead agency. We have 10 minutes left for this forum. Um, I'm going to uh, pose questions. Uh, in a manner that might be a little faster so that we can move through the remaining uh, questions. Again, if your question was specific to City of Vallejo policy and practices, this panel has been assembled so that we could look at the process of moving uh, information to legislators and people that make the laws because our law enforcement community enforce the laws. So we have to go beyond our local community and our city and our city staff with the questions we're asking. We will take those questions, however, and provide them to the appropriate person and they will respond accordingly. So we're not ignoring the question. We will have to send them through the right channels. This question is regarding the LBGTQIA community. 6.5% of, the population, of uh, the population of Vallejo are identified as such. Are officers and dispatch trained to handle these special, the special needs of this particular community? And how does the Vallejo Police Department plan to handle this, the distrust that is built within that community, especially those of color? I'll take a quick moment to say that uh, recently AB 2504 was passed, which required all law enforcement in the basic academy to attend four hours of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity training. So that has been recently put together through a team of subject matter experts. It's going through the process of piloting programs and through the Office of Administra uh, Administrative Legal Affairs to make sure that uh, we're catching everything we need to catch. Once that is in place, we're also going to be, uh, we will make available to all law, law enforcement agencies in the state uh, a four hour uh, in-service training uh, covering the, uh, the same material. Uh, but there, are, just to put out, there are uh, training courses uh, that cover this, this requested material that is currently out there and available to law enforcement um, in certain parts of the state that is available to all law enforcement. One of the things that I see in many of the cards that I've had to filter through, and it's a challenge, um, is some pain that people are having. And I'm, I have to make sure that they are represented here as well. Uh, the, uh, this question uh, is an individual would like to address the overall issue of discrimination and treatment of certain groups of people. How are you going to make sure in the future that, that they are not in, uh, uncomfortable uh, seeking police assistance when filing a police report? Their experience is that it comes across as a joke or unimportant, especially as they are transgender. Well, it, um from the police perspective, uh, Those are the last ones. I think I mentioned constitutional policing earlier. I think every, every single person deserves the same treatment across the board from us. So when it's not happening, it's not acceptable. Um, and I think we would all agree that systemically uh, there are people groups, uh, many of them already mentioned today, that are uh, victimized at every level of government interaction and social interaction and uh, inner business interaction where the government isn't involved at all. So uh, we're just one piece, law enforcement is one piece of it. Um, uh, but we all have a piece of it because uh, these questions wouldn't be asked unless all of us were a piece of the problem as well as a piece of the solution. 
And so uh, we have to look at policing from a constitutional perspective of law. That means everyone should be treated okay. And obviously that's, that's not the case. Uh, that's good and um, appreciate that, Chief. But I also want to add that uh, engagement with the police can't just always be on a 911 call or when there's a, when there's a, a, a stop or, or something like that. The engagement of the police has to start in building relationships, being present when there is a, 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 an event, an LGBTQ event, and, and it's going to take investment from the city, and it's going to take investment from the police department. To uh, so, And I know this is incredibly difficult because of the understaffing crisis that we're in right now, but to be able to have representation, just even if it means a stop by and and walking, you know, walking through the event, shaking hands. Uh, this is what's so wonderful about SROs that are actually there, uh, working, you know, with students and being having a presence there more than just to arrest a student, but to actually be on campus and to talk and engage with students when they're having their emotional breakdowns. And, and being that steady, constant voice for them. So I'm t my point is, is being able to engage the community and build relationships before the crisis happens. Thank you. These are questions specific to potential legislation. We need an action plan um, for this committee, for this forum. We need an action plan, and we need to know what our legislators can do in helping us with that. What our legislators... Uh, this is Mr. Robert McConnell. Will our legislators introduce legislation to make inadmissible actual conversations between city council members and the families of victims of uh, police uh, shootings or otherwise? Currently, uh, the city attorney uh, enforces a restriction on uh, communications directly between council members and those families because that information conversation can be called for in court. So how can we go about getting legislation to allow our council to speak with them and that private conversation not be admissible? That wouldn't pass the first Judiciary Committee you know, hearing. Uh, you know, there's only, you have an attorney-client privilege. We had one the other day. I, I can't remember exactly what it was off the top of my head. Well, Wanting to give somebody, uh, you know, that privilege. I guess it was in, you know, the U a union shop steward, and you know, it's just wh where do you stop on that? The fact of the matter, when when a city council member talks to somebody, uh, you know, maybe there's something that's said in there that uh, that is important to the case. So I don't know that you'd have, that you'd want to do that. Uh, well, I do respect that the city attorney, and when I was a county supervisor for 14 years, they didn't like us talking to anybody. And the, the, the reality is, I mean, you know, about certain cases, the bottom line, from my standpoint, um, you know, I, I, I think, and I, I want to walk a fine line because I'm not, uh, I, I really was, wasn't aware or not aware of the, what, you know, what happened around in, in this community. But I'm just saying, in general, your city attorney can tell you, council, you, this is what you have to do. At the end of the day, I'm an elected official. You elected me. I can do whatever the hell I want to do. Well said, Senator Dodd. Senator. <laughs> I... Uh, um, uh, when it comes to legislation, I, I don't think it would be wise for me right now to commit to uh, I'll do this or I'll do that. But what I have committed to is making sure that as a representative of you, to be able to pave a pathway for you to come and be able to make your voice and my voice join with your voice and make it heard in the hallways and the offices of the Capitol. So just recently, uh, as of today, as a matter of fact, I met with some family members and uh, we're opening up an invitation for them to come and talk to two champions. And uh, the second champion was actually Senator Dodd who suggested it when I told him what I had done. Uh, but I am inviting the families to come and let your voice be heard from Dr. Weber. Uh, Assemblymember Weber was the champion of uh, AB 392. And then also Senator Bradford, uh, very close to both of us. 
And these are two strong champions. And to be able to connect your voice with them will create the movement that you're looking for in this state that will create a wave that will go nationally. So that's what I can commit to as well as legislation. And, and, and let me go back to my statement. And I'm not walking it back at all, but I just think it's important for the council members. You know, when I was a supervisor, I was full-time supervisor. So, you know, it's, it's not like I have a job during the day. I, I think sometimes when you have that situation, what we ought to do is we ought to allow council members, if you're an attorney, whether you're a county or not, look, at, you're, they're never going to discuss the case with you because that would – more than likely would be a, a, a breach of your, your responsibility to the citizenry of the community that you represent. But at the same time, uh, being able to go out and show your empathy as a, as a human being is really what I, what I was talking about. Will you put forth uh, draft legislation um, from the state level to create a model where social workers are routinely involved in police responses. Is that something that can come from the state? Uh, thank you for that, because we didn't need state uh, involvement to be able to accomplish that in the city of Concord. We were able to put a mental health expert into the front seat of a vehicle. Uh, now this was in particular not to uh, the crisis and tragedies that we're talking about here, but we were trying to address the homeless issue in Concord. And so we partnered with the county and we actually had a mental health expert in the front seat of a car with an officer. The sole responsibility was to go seek out homeless and then to assess them the best they could on the spot. And instead of 51 ing them only to see them 24 to 72 hours later on the same spot, they actually were given or directed to the services that they need. And three years later, we have a worker at Safeway in Concord that is a product of that program. So it worked out awesome. So go get them, City of Vallejo. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I would like to give an opportunity to Supervisor Monica Brown um, to step forth on the mental health uh, uh, issue, um, AB 1769. Can you share with us some information? Come on down so we can have a mic. Thank you. I just wanted to address that the Solano County Health and Social Services worked with Assemblyman Jim Frazier to get $14 million so that we could build a mental health facility on Beck Avenue to have wraparound services. It's Senate Bill, oh, not Senate Bill, I'm sorry, Assembly Bill 1769, I think that's what I wrote. I wrote. It made it everywhere, but it's stuck in appropriation. So I wanted to use the time to say, if we could get that through and we could build that, we could be in Solano County, the model of how we use wraparound services and to take our mental health residents, 35 is what we want with the $14 million. So we try to help guys, but we're a poor county. I'm going to share that with you. We don't have some of the resources at Contra Costa. We certainly don't have it elsewhere. So we are definitely needing the state to help us. So if you guys could help us through that, Gavin Newsom says he has a billion dollars to help our homeless and to house our folks. So we would like 14 million in Solano County to build this mental health facility. And therefore, we can then be the model of how the other 57 counties could be utilized to help our folks. So I Short of, uh, yeah, I, I, I've never, it just does not happen. So it's not coming out. It's not coming out this year. But, but well, I, I hope so. I, I think one of the other things that we ought to be doing, and I had a, uh, a meeting a couple weeks ago with uh, David Rabbit, supervisor from Sonoma County, uh, Alfredo Pedroza uh, from Napa County, and uh, Supervisor Spearing here from uh, Solano County talking about maybe a better way of doing that, which would be to get a regional program going. Because these one, what the, what the Appropriations Committee or Chair does not like is one county coming and asking for $14 million. And so the, we're better off of having a regional program so the counties can work together 
uh, on this. And, and we, we're, I think all the other, the other counties were saying, we don't care if it's in Solano County. If there's a bigger challenge in Solano County than there is in Napa and Sonoma, by all means, let's do it. But let's get something started. Let's get something physically located, you know, so that all the counties can, because we all have mental health issues. Mental health issues is just not confined to here. We've got them everywhere through, throughout our world. We're going to take that offline because you two have direct lines of communication. Uh, there is a plan there. It seems that there's a plan there, and that is work in cohesiveness with the other counties, find a location, allocate the resource to build a building that might hold 300 people. So let's get together with those other counties. I do have a, qu a point of information here, and then we're going to have the panel give a one-minute uh, uh, closing. Um, the, qu the question came from uh, one of the attendees, uh, LaDonna Williams, and it's why are, we, why are you not allowing the public to ask questions directly. This is censoring the public. This setup is uh, talking at the public and not engaging. There's a couple of answers to this that I, I want to make sure that I cover. One is, upon the arrival, the congressman asked, could we put the table down? Because we don't want to talk down to people. The committee set this up so that, because we had no way of knowing what the attendance was going to be. So we had to have the table, the uh, days elevated as opposed to being on the level of everyone so that the people in the far back would be able to see. So that's the reason that they are elevated. The reason we used a card process was because we had a very limited time. There is protocol for everything and we need to move beyond the individual pain and it's hard to do that. We have to move towards creating policy, legislation, and guidelines that will move us forward. We can yell at each other all we want. You can yell at the city council all you want. Nobody hears it. In fact, we've watched it shut down the meeting. It's not an effective way to communicate. It's not an effective way to bring about change. So this is the reason that we established a format of the card process. We apologize if anybody's offended by it, but it seemed to have worked very efficiently in this model. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Gentlemen. And one thing I'm going to recommend to the committee is, I'm a cursor. I've got, forgive me. One thing I'm going to make a recommendation to is that we absolutely have representation from ladies at the next forum. We need to make sure that we have diversity in all of our units. I'd like, pardon me? You can call yourself anything you want. Thank you. Uh, I'd like the panel, starting from Chief, to give us your take, your outtake from this particular engagement and tell us what you feel that you can go back and do to bring about ch the changes that you see based on the questions are needed. Um, well, that's a, that's a big ask. Yes, but, it is. Uh, it's, it's obviously clear that there's pain in the community and, and people want the police department's interactions to be uh, not more professional, that's the wrong word, but more human. Um, our interactions would be more human across the board with people. Um, and so, you know, that would be the goal. My conversation when I go back, people were interested there at the police department uh, about this meeting. And um, the, the folks there have been down for about a decade. They've been, uh, they've been, they've had a really hard shop for 10 years. And so I said, stay home on Saturday. I'll go. Um, I'm curious. I, I'm looking forward to getting back and saying, it's, it's exactly what you expected, hurting people, sharing their hearts, um, and we have to be uh, attuned to that. And so we'll have the conversation in, in my shop. Thank you. We appreciate, uh, Post appreciates uh, you allowing us to come and uh, be part of this panel. Post represents all law enforcement throughout the state, but we are not, uh, we are not so big that we can't listen and respond to the needs of a particular community for particular reasons. Um, we are very excited, especially regions, uh, recently, post uh, in this past year has received more funding um, and the ability to reach out than in many, many, many years past. So we look forward to continuing to push out the, the training that is important to communities, important to law enforcement, important to making sure the interaction between law enforcement and community is safe, yet effective. 
So um, we'll continue to listen in any need from a community. Uh, I, can, I can speak for all post representatives that we will be do everything we can to, uh, to meet those needs. Thank you. Same thing. Same thing. You know, I think we've got a lot of work to do. I think we've got a lot of work to do as a community. I really appreciate, uh, first of all, the opportunity to be here. Uh, this, this meeting here came as a result of a conversation with community members. And those community members, I want to thank them so much for uh, coming and telling us about the pain you know, that they've suffered through uh, some of these altercations that happened in the community. And I'd like to thank them for getting uh, giving us the opportunity to, to be in, engaged. But this is the beginning, it's not the middle, even it's the beginning. It's a long road, but uh, I commit, uh, I brought uh, what you all know, or many of you know, Tom Barty, who's been a part in planning that, so I wanna thank him. But I also uh, have Heather Hopkins here, who's from uh, my Sacramento office in the Capitol, that does all the legislation in this area. And I wanted her to be here to listen to the community and to pick up ideas of things perhaps that we can be doing uh, in the future from a legislative standpoint. It's an honor to be able to be here. Thank you very much. And we all need to work together to make it a better place, as our young poet said, a better place. And we do that by making it, uh, by working on it together. I'm committed to delivering any resources I can possibly uh, deliver. I've mentioned some, but that also includes investment and work training and education, things that really help a community avoid situations like this. So thank you very much, and I look forward to our continuing working together. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today so that I can, I can listen and I can learn. It's uh, obvious that there's a need to build trust and confidence between our citizens, uh, our citizens and those that are sworn to uh, serve and protect. I can help and will focus my efforts on transparency, accountability, and training uh, as a result of, well, beforehand, but as, especially as a result of this meeting today. Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, we shall overcome. We're still overcoming, which means we haven't arrived. But that doesn't mean we stop. It means we continue to work together until we do overcome. And I believe together we can. Thank you. I, I feel the, the, the weight of this meeting. I'm, unfortunately, I came in thinking you will have, many of you, we've been in conversations like this. We have discussions and sometimes we leave, you know, nothing happens. But I, I feel the weight of it. I wrote down uh, some things. I've been, had the opportunity to serve for about 12, 13 years now as a volunteer Vallejo police chaplain. And I've sat on the uh, the table on the other side of tables of grieving families and I've been to the emergency rooms and I've, do I've done the funerals and I've met with the police and the families and I've looked at the videos and I've helped to provide information both to the police and to families and and I I've received phone calls and one stands out in my mind of a group of kids in my neighborhood that were shooting a rap video and they didn't have drugs involved and the, the, they didn't have <clears throat> they were just gathered in the park and the music wasn't that loud but someone called and and they, they, they into, in their words, they were harassed by the police. And so I called the chief, and he was willing to meet with them and 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 help. And I was uh, and helped me facilitate that meeting. And the 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 kids eventually backed out of the meeting. But I, I was grateful for the police willing to. I said all that to say that I want to pursue those type of. Uh, I wrote down a note: black, brown badge, and and that we can kind of have those discussions. And um, so I feel the weight of of wanting to pursue those type of discussions uh, further in our, in our community. And uh, so I, I actually feel encouraged uh, by doing that. Hi, thanks for, first off, for inviting me. Um, I just wanted to, to say that I'm a promoter of civilian oversight uh, of the police. And I say that not as a critic of the police, but as someone who has worked to try to bridge the gaps between communities and police officers. Um, I believe that civilian oversight agencies can fulfill that role and they're an added value to your community and to law enforcement. Um, I commit to be a resource to you all. Please take one of these uh, resources here. There's a lot of information in it. My contact information is there. If you would like to follow up with me about ideas that you may have in civilian oversight 
or even if your community would like to have another meeting and just talk about the different models and what might be possible, I'm happy to come out and do that. So thank you again. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming out and supporting. I want to thank everybody here for coming out. I want you to be clear that we asked everybody from Barbara Lee to Gavin Newsom to come and support those that chose to come are, are here. I want LaDonna to know that um, that was an issue for for some of us in terms of, because our other events, they've always been able to come up and, and talk and what have you, but they thought that we would have such a huge audience that we would have to do it a different way. So I want you to know that that was a struggle and a conversation that we had because I do it totally different. But at the same time, I want you to remember that we are still in a fight. This is not easy and it has been emotional and a lot of us wake up in the middle of the night stressing over this. I understand that the police department is there to support us, but I also understand, let me first say this, that I'm not talking about those police officers that are there diligently there to support us and to help us, but I'm talking about those rogue ones that are out there killing us. Was asked at one point, can we use a different word other than killing? So should we use murder or should we use assassinate or whatever it is? But these are the things that are happening in our community. We need to also understand that it's, it's a great thing for the police to get out there and play midnight basketball and all of the above, but you still have to deal with the fact that there are people out there that are afraid today, this second, this moment of our police department. And that has gone back from slavery as far as you can, can imagine. It needs to change. Our city council, I ask you to start thinking about our money resources so that we can start involving that and, and getting monies to our police department, whatever it is that we need so that we can have some change here. We have to stop talking. I'm so tired of talking. That is all we do. And we go from one spot to the next spot to the next spot, and nothing is accomplished. Well, this crew of people, we're just tired of it. I want to thank, the, the when I say the crew, I'm talking about Michelle um, Adolph. I'm talking about Liette Meitzenheimer. I'm talking about Maui Phil. I'm talking about Izzy Drum Gooley. I'm talking about Susan George. I'm talking, and TJ Walkup. I'm talking about the people that you don't see out there. You don't see us, but we're in those trenches. Some of us have been told that because of what we do, we don't matter. Some of us have been told that the 20 years or more of work that we have been doing is nothing. I'm trying to get rid of this fly. It is absolutely nothing. But a lot of you are standing on the shoulders of the people that have been in the trenches trying to make changes in this community forever. It's not solely, like I said, just about the families. These things have been going on forever. So one of the things that I really remember and appreciate when I sat with Senator Dodd, when I asked him, why should I vote for you or why should I tell a community member that you should, I should vote for you or you should vote for him, when we have not heard any of these people's voices, not one. What I appreciated about him at the end, he said, I'm sorry. And I'm going to do what I can to make a difference. I've also heard, and I'm saying this in front of you guys, that none of you guys are going to make a difference. You're going to talk about it. You're going to pontificate about it. And nothing is going to transpire. But I am hoping that that is not true. We need change in this community. I wake up in the middle of the night. Many years ago, my daughter told me of a cir circumstance when they rolled up on her and she had a hoodie on. This is before Trayvon Martin and all the rest of the stuff. And when they saw that she was a young lady, then the whole atmosphere changed. But what if I got a knock on my door saying that my daughter was dead because she didn't look the right way or she didn't say the right thing? We teach our kids to be proud of who they are, to be proud kings and queens. But the police department, you need to deal with this. When they approach us, make us have to look down. We can't ha hold our heads up high because we just might die. And you need to realize that. 
I'm talking to you and anybody else there that can hear us. And I'm not a mean person. I'm just telling you what is happening in our community. And we need to start dealing with that. We need change. Action plan. Stop talking on the phones, y'all. Stop talking on those phones about what's going on. Let's get out in the communities. Call your senator. Call your congressman. Tell them what you need. And if they can't do it, then election time is coming up. Then you show them through the vote, through the ballot, as to what is going to happen or transpire. We need people that are going to support us. We need people that are going to be there for us. And we need people that when they talk, we know that what they say they're going to do, your word must be your bond. I am grateful. Thank you so much. And with that, I want to tell everybody, and Melissa, Sister Melissa, I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to the families. I'm grateful that you stood up and that you're not afraid. And when the Vallejo Police Department sent a message out there, when, you, when it was mentioned that you were getting death threats, that you just needed to deal with that. That's written on the Vallejo Police Department's, what is it, a VPOA union? I got that. I'll send that to you so that you can see. This woman's life matters. We don't need to be in fear. So the action plan is call your congressman, call your senator, do whatever you need to do. Let them know we will not tolerate this. Get out there and vote. Register and tell those kids to get here. Tell them they need to be here. Tell those elementary school, bring them. They don't want to come, bring them anyway. One of the things that I remember when my mother used to ask me, do you want to go and do such and such? I would say, no, ma'am, I don't want to do it. But she asked me. Her response was, well, you want to do it anyway. And I'm so grateful today because of it. And that's how they will grow. I appreciate you. I love you. And I have a gentleman over here that is going to say something and perform for you. Brother, brother, brother. Pastor, many of you cry. You know we got to find a way to bring some love here today. Brother, brother, that's too many of you crying. Brother, 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 that's too many of you dying. You know we have to find a way to bring some love. Picket signs don't front of me with brutality. Come on, talk to me, and you can see what's going on. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on?